Brother Dave works with News Service 2000, and he can tell you a lot more about that than I can. But many of you are familiar with uh, Dr. Pat, and, and Dr. Pat um, is who Dave works with. And so she is the one who brought him on board, he said, last September. So he's fairly new to their program, but he's been very busy. And I'm sure he'll tell you all about the stuff he's been doing. He spent eight weeks in Israel? No. Three and a half. Three and a half weeks Three in Israel, and then working other places on yep. top of that yep. um, this spring. So he's been out of the country quite a bit, busy yep. and, and doing the work that goes with that. And they do a tremendous work um, with the persecuted church and keeping us in America and other places where we are tremendously blessed, um, keeping us informed that it's not all beautiful and easy and wonderful everywhere else in the world for Christians. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, he's going to be talking about that today, and he's going to be showing some video and some other stuff. And, and I would just uh, invite you to uh, listen to what he has to say. Let it sink into your heart. Be grateful to God for, frankly, just how abundantly, richly, ridiculously blessed we are. And then pray for the persecuted church. It was just a scant few weeks ago on Palm Sunday that 49 people were killed going to worship in Egypt, in one country alone, because they love Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, just because they love Jesus. They, they weren't going to have a war. They weren't going to fight. They weren't, they weren't causing problems. They weren't breaking laws. They just went to Palm Sunday Church mm -hmm. and were killed. And so we don't face that here. We might have somebody make a joke about us. Ouch, right? I can live through that. Nobody's tried to bomb me because I'm a pastor. And so uh, what... Dave has to share, I, I take to heart and uh, challenge you to allow that as well to penetrate and, and be meaningful to us today. So thank you for coming and being willing to share with us, Dave. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Pastor. I want to start out just, just sharing uh, a little bit about myself so that you know who I am. You know where my heart is. Um, I would never say I was born a Christian because I understand having worked with Child Evangelism Fellowship, that's not the way you become a Christian. But I can say I was born a Baptist General Conference person. <laughs> um, and so your church is a lot like home to me. I have, I have been in the Baptist church my entire life. Um, and your worship team was wonderful this morning. I just want to say that. I travel around to a lot of different churches. And back at my home church in Superior, Wisconsin, we have a wonderful worship team. So when I'm away from my church, I miss it. This morning, I didn't miss it. Um, I just want to say that. That was, that was fantastic. And thank you. The other thing I wanted to share with you is that how important it is it was for me to get here today. Um, I was at a conference. I was invited to the President's Gathering for the American Bible Society um, over the last three days, and actually it continues into today. And because I was speaking here, I left, I left there yesterday. Um, we had, and I didn't know that when I went, we had Matt Mayer Meyer, there uh, for our worship leader. He wrote one of the songs that we sang this morning. We also had Lee Strobel there as the guest speaker, and I didn't know he was going to be there. And I'm not one for dropping names, but when he was having breakfast right behind me, I was like, oh, <laughs> isn't there a movie about him? <laughs> um, but I knew I had to be here this morning. I knew that your missions week was an important thing to you, and I had a commitment to be here. And it's that important to me to share with you what I'm going to share this morning. So let's open. I'm going to ask to open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would bless us this morning. I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that your thoughts would be my thoughts and your words would be my words. And Lord, may we just have a blessed time of fellowship as a part of the body of Christ today. May everything we think, say, and do be glorifying to you. In your precious name, amen. I am going to share from the Word of God because I think people come to church to hear from the Word of God. I'm not going to give you an hour-long 
advertisement for what News Service 2000 is. Because God has laid something on my heart that I want to share with each one of you. Typically, when I'm asked to speak in a church, um, this is true, this goes back for a while now that I've been speaking in churches, um, I ask God, what should I share? And I start praying. And typically, it's something that God is laying on my own heart, something he's impressing on me that I need to change, that I need to fix, that I need to be aware of, that I also need to share with the body of Christ. It's no different today, except that the message today is one that started stirring in my heart two years ago, two and a half years ago. I was sitting in my church library, and I walked into your church library. Again, a real feeling of home as I looked at the titles of the books you have in there. But I was sitting in my church library, and God impressed on my heart. We had a 20 minutes before church started. I'm one of those guys who likes to get to church early, and I'm sitting there, and God impressed on my heart to read the book of Haggai. I can't even say that I knew immediately where to turn to. I knew it was an Old Testament book. I knew it was one of the minor prophets, but it isn't a book that I had read much. And so I read the book of Haggai. It's a story about a prophet telling the people of Israel that God has said, it's time for you to complete the temple that you started 17 years ago. Two chapters long, didn't take me long to read it. For the next month and a half, I read the book of Haggai almost daily. And as I read it, I asked the same questions. I worked for Child Evangelism Fellowship for nine years as as the Minnesota State Director. Um, And when we teach children to read the Bible, we tell them to ask three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? And what is God saying to me? And so I asked those same questions about the book of Haggai. I didn't know what it was. Is it something in my life that had to change? Is it a sermon that had to be prepared? Is it a book that needed to be written? I didn't know what God was impressing upon my heart yet. And so I started looking into the temple that had to be rebuilt. And I started looking into the temple of God. Ultimately, what God was saying to me was something completely unexpected for me. And I'll share about that as we get toward the end of this service. But my searching for God's truth about the temple led me to other passages. And while Haggai was talking about the physical structure of the temple, since the time of Christ's death and resurrection, the temple of the living God resides within us. And so I'm going to share some of the scripture that God led me to as I was reading about the temple. I'm going to begin in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verses 19 and 22, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You know, many times growing up in a Baptist church in particular, I guess, um, I've heard that my body is the temple of God, that I need to be careful what I eat, what I watch, what I listen to. Because my body is the temple of God and I should treat it with respect. But this passage goes even further. It says that we corporately are the temple of the living God. Whether we're within this body of believers here in Aiken, Minnesota, or the body of believers that I worship with in Superior, Wisconsin, or the body of believers in Kenya, North Africa, the Middle East, the Far East. Corporately, we are being built into the temple of the living God. When I was 16, my parents decided to move from Lincoln, Nebraska, where I had lived 
um, for the majority of my childhood. <clears throat> I had just graduated or got passed out of ninth grade, was going into tenth grade. Not an easy time to be a child. Um, if any of you are parents, eighth, ninth grade, you know those years well. Um, I was going into tenth grade and leaving behind all of my friends, everything I knew, my church, my youth group, everything. And it was a hard thing for me. It was a crisis situation. The week before, I attended a, a Bible camp, before we moved, actually. And I was finally able to tell all my friends, because my dad was leaving the work that he had been in. Um, we couldn't tell everybody until we were ready to leave. Um, so he gave us two-week notice, and we could tell people. Um, the week before, I was at a Bible camp, and I was having a rough time, because I was leaving all my friends. The last day of camp, one of the counselors pulled me aside and he said, You know, Dave, wherever you go, you will find the body of Christ. And he was right. I ended up in Superior, Wisconsin at a Baptist General Conference church and immediately I had a connection with the people. I knew what they believed. I knew how they would respond in different situations. I knew that we served a common Savior. That counselor gave me wisdom that went beyond anything a camp counselor normally can share or does share. Because I knew when I walked into the church that my parents had selected that the youth group believed the same things, that the youth group knew and understood that Jesus Christ had died for their sins. That training went on. Uh, my parents, being uh, very strong Christians, my mom would lead Bible studies in our home throughout my childhood. And at those Bible studies would be born-again Catholics and Lutherans and Baptists, people of all denominations, but they all knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. As I continued my study of the temple and now the body of Christ, Christ's prayer was that we would be one. And that became my prayer. That somehow the body of Christ could become the beautiful bride of Christ in unity, in strength, and in worship to the Father. As I kept looking at the temple and now the body of Christ, I found another gift from God to the church, communion. Communion. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And then Paul talks about how all the parts are important that the ear is no less important than the eye, or the foot is no less important than the hand. What is important is that they are all working together with the gifts and the blessings that God has put upon them. Because if my hand, if my hand decides to do what it wants, apart from the rest of my body, that could be a real problem, especially if I'm driving. The body of Christ is meant to work and operate as one. And yet we often don't do that. You know, when I was in Gaza, um, with my traveling in the Middle East this, this spring, and I will tell you, prior to that trip, the extent of my travel was Canada. <laughs> so it was eye-opening for me. But we went into Gaza, Gaza is a strip of land about 25 miles long, two and a half miles wide, with one and a half million people in it. In that land, there are three churches. There's a Catholic church, an Orthodox church, and a Baptist church. In 1.5 million people, those three churches have about 
500 believers. And there they know what it means to be the body of Christ because those three churches are working together to meet the needs of the refugees, to meet the needs of the poor and downtrodden. Those three churches, although theologically different, are working together to show Jesus Christ to the people around them. And the one that stood out the most to me, we went to the two of the three churches, but we met with Abuna Mario and Father Mario in the Catholic Church. And he just shined Jesus out of his eyes. He runs a school for children in Gaza. And as we walked outside into the parking lot, which is their playground, the children mobbed Abuna Mario. They came running up to him to ask him questions, to give him a hug, to, to get his attention. Because Abuna Mario has made it his priority to share the love of Jesus Christ with those children. The other thing you should know about Abuna Mario is he's from South America. He doesn't have to be in the Gaza Strip. Most of the people in the Gaza Strip are not allowed to leave. They have been there for years. Their borders are sealed shut by Egypt and by Israel. But Abuna Mario went there of his own free will to work with the children and the people of Gaza. And he loves those people. And he wants them to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Those three churches are working together to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. And, and I'm speaking as a converged Baptist General Conference person myself. So often we won't even look at the church down the street when they're going through a split or have just lost a pastor. We need to be united as the body of Christ to help one another, to pray for one another. Got off track a little bit. I apologize for that. <laughs> Paul goes on to end that passage about the body of Christ with verse 26. And if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You know, a lot of times when we take communion, we think about our own life and how Christ has made a difference and changed our hearts. We think about the things in our life that we need to get right before we take communion. But do we often think as we take communion that this is what unifies us as the body of Christ? This is what pulls us together to be the temple of the living God. You see, we are one body, the body of Christ. And because we are the body of Christ, we are the temple of the living God. Not because God doesn't have a place to live. Because God chooses to reside within us. God desires us to know him so intimately, corporately, and individually, that he chooses to reside within us. One more passage concerning the body of Christ that played a huge role in where God was taking me in Haggai. Hebrews 13.3. And it's a key note for News Service 2000, a key verse that we use frequently. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. See, through all this, God was stirring in my heart a passion for the body of Christ. I was a state director for Child Evangelism Fellowship and I loved what I did. I loved reaching children with the gospel. I loved sharing the ministry of CEF with churches. I get thrilled when I hear about VBS programs um, because children are also very deep in my heart. But God was stirring in my heart 
about the body of Christ and the unity that Christ prayed for. You know, right before his death, Christ prayed that they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Those words hit me really hard. Does the world believe that Jesus Christ was sent by the Father? And if not, why not? Jesus gave us the formula right there that they may be one just as we are one so that the world may believe that you have sent me. How important is our existence as the body of Christ, our unity, our care for one another? In Haggai, I began with this passage. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and you harvest little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And those who earn wages does so to put them in bags with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. This little used book of the Bible has so much more that could be shared. The reasons why they had put off finishing the temple. The promises that God made to them that the temple that you will rebuild will be far greater than Solomon's temple. Not because it would be more splendid, but because within this temple, Jesus Christ would be. There's a lot in Haggai that could be preached on and talked about. But the verse that hit me over and over and over again was, is it a time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while my house lies in ruins? And you see, God had been working in my heart about the persecuted church, and I heard Dr. Pat come and speak, and it moved me. And so we started getting the prayer letter, and I'm going to ask you to sign up for the prayer letter in a little bit. Um, and the prayer letter moved me. And when you, pray for some, when you pray for people, expect God to move, but also expect Him to move you. As I started praying for the persecuted church, my desire to do something, to be involved, grew deeper. And so we started giving to ministries that helped the churches in those countries where they are persecuted. But that wasn't enough. God kept working and drilling into me. And I asked Dr. Pat, Pat, can I go on a trip with you to the Middle East? I thought if I could see those churches, if I could meet those believers, I would be doing what God was stirring in my heart. And then last August... God impressed upon me to ask Dr. Pat, what would it look like if I came alongside you? See, Dr. Pat has been doing this ministry for 34 years. She's 65 years old. She travels the globe helping persecuted Christians. She travels the United States sharing messages in churches to get our churches praying for those people. But she's one person. What I didn't know was her board had been praying that someone would be raised up that could come alongside Dr. Pat. It was a match made in heaven and it works wonderfully and I was able to travel to the Middle East and now I'm able to share with the body of Christ about the brothers and sisters in the Middle East. Um what God was doing in my, my heart with the book of Haggai. And originally I thought the temple that, that, that lies in ruins, that's those persecuted Christians over there. They need help. We need to go over and encourage them and lift them up. And after I had traveled over there, after I've read the books that I've read, the joy of Christ is in those people. 
standing strong in their faith is not a problem that they have. I believe the temple that lies in ruins is our churches here in America because we need to become and take our place as the body of Christ that exists around the world. We need to be in prayer for our brothers and sisters who are struggling to share the gospel wherever they can, that aren't afraid to stand on a street corner even though they may be hauled into the police, even though they may be imprisoned or beaten, that aren't afraid to sneak a copy of the Bible across borders that don't allow them, that aren't afraid to open up their church doors on the Sunday Easter after the Palm Sunday bombings. I'm going to share with you just a few stories about people that Dr. Pat has had contact with and I've actually been able to meet now myself. The stories go back a few years, so they're not quite as current. If you receive our prayer letter, those are stories that are happening today. Okay, But these are examples of what Christians in other countries have been and continue to face. Pastor Jack, someone in the Sunday school class asked me about Pastor Jack. I was able to meet Pastor Jack. His family is all fine. I know that uh, people who were receiving our prayer letter years ago were praying for Jack and his wife and their daughters. And they have two sons as well, two daughters and two sons. And they are all doing well and fine. They are all proclaiming Christ. So I'm going to tell you about Pastor Jack a little bit. He lives in Cairo, Egypt. When Pat first met him, he was 22 years old. This was a while ago. Um, He became a Christian. He was given the gift of evangelism, which in Egypt is not an easy gift to have. But Jack chose to follow God's law, which says, go and make disciples of all nations. And so he shares his faith. Within his first three years as a Christian, Jack led 3,000 people to Christ. He became noticed by the government and by the extremists, and he has had his car run off the road multiple times. He has had to replace his vehicle multiple times. He has been beaten. He has been brought in for interrogation. Pastor Jack knows what it means to be have to stand firm in his faith. And yet he continues. When I was over there, (laughs) Pastor Jack has such such an enthusiasm about sharing the word. He walks into a church, and I was allowed to preach in one of the churches in Egypt, and Jack translated. And when I was done, Jack went on for another 45 minutes. (laughs) I thought, maybe I didn't explain things well enough or something. (laughs) Um, He loves to share the gospel. He loves to preach. Even though he will be called in again and he will be beaten again and he will face persecution again, Jack continues to share Jesus Christ with the people around him. Next one I want to talk about is is Jack's daughter. Uh, Jack's daughter, Patty. Patty, um, on her first day of school at age six, And I know you have some children here that are about six years old. At age six, her first day of school, Patty was there, and she realized right away she was the only Christian. You see, the teacher was going up and down the aisles asking each child to recite from the Koran. And she came to Patty, and Patty said, I don't know the Koran. I only know the Bible. And in her innocence, as a six-year-old child, Patty said, and the Koran is a bad book. The teacher went to the corner of the room where in the classroom they had a bamboo stick that was about three feet high and two feet around, or two inches around. And she struck Patty's hand so hard that it broke the fingers in her hand. Patty understands what it means to be persecuted for Jesus Christ. 
Patty also had the gift of evangelism, and by eight years old, Patty was leading her Muslim classmates to Christ, which is very dangerous over there because those children would be severely punished if their parents found out, and Patty, at eight years old, could be arrested and thrown in jail. Next one I want to talk to you about is Morgan. Morgan is Patty's brother. He also knew about persecution. He also was the only Christian in his class. And over there, the Muslims are taught that Christians are dirty, that they are bad, that they don't take baths, that they don't deserve to be treated as equals, that they should be servants and not friends. Because of this, as Morgan was out in the playground, the other students would kick him and punch him and throw him to the ground and smear dirt all over him because he was a believer, because he was a Christian. Morgan came home at six years old also in tears, and his father, Pastor Jack, said to him, Morgan, all you can do is go back to school and let the love of Christ shine out of you. So Morgan did. And today, to this day, one of Morgan's chief tormentors is now his best friend. Because he allowed Jesus to shine out of his life. And these kids, although they're young adults now, have no fear in their faith. They stand up immediately. If you question any of them, what, are you afraid because they might find out you're a believer? I'm not afraid. They, they take offense to that. The youngest one, Robbie, has a cross tattooed on his wrist. His father discouraged him from doing that. But Robbie wants to be just like his dad, who also has a cross tattooed on his wrist. Because it tells other believers, I'm with you. I'm a part of the body of Christ. And even though that cross may cause him to be persecuted or beaten, Robbie wanted that stamped on his body so others will know he is a follower of Jesus Christ. If you have the clipboards and haven't passed them around, I will tell you the clipboards are to receive our prayer letters. They're not fundraising mechanisms. They're prayer letters. We want the body of Christ united in praying for the body of Christ elsewhere. We send them out monthly. They have stories, many stories of what's currently going on, primarily in the Middle East and North Africa, but also in other parts of the world. And uh, we call them prayer letters because that's what they are. We want you to pray for the church. Write very clearly, if you could, please. I want to make sure that the new prayer letters get to you. And if you put in an email address, we do not send our prayer letters electronically because they contain sensitive information. The emails are only so we can send out special prayer requests that are needed, like after the bombings in Egypt. Okay? One more. Maybe two. Alex was a young Christian man who was coming out of his apartment. Please pray for Alex. A Muslim neighbor came up and asked him, Why are you a Christian? Now, you are not supposed to evangelize or witness to Muslims. But if they ask you, you can answer. And so Alex did. He told the man what Christ had done in his own life. He told the man why he believed what he believed. A couple days later, Alex was picked up by the police. He was brought to a prison and thrown into a common cell with a bunch of other prisoners. And as the guards shut the door, they told the other prisoners he was witnessing to Muslims. The other prisoners started kicking him, hitting him, punching him. They injured his ribs for four hours. After four hours, the prisoners went over to the corner and got a bucket of human waste and poured it over Alex's head. And at that time, the guard came back to the room. 
They picked up Alex. They brought him to the chief of police. And the chief of police looked at Alex and said, I'm sorry, Alex, we arrested the wrong man. But remember Ali. Ali was the man who had asked him, why are you a Christian? The point was made, don't share your faith. But Alex continues to serve the risen Savior. These stories go on and on and on, and there are books you can buy. There are other organizations that you can get much information about what's going on around the world in the body of Christ. But I think as a society, we here in America have actually hardened our hearts against all the stuff we see on TV, all the stuff we read in the paper. We hear about a bombing that took place in Egypt, and we think, that's what happens over there. There are brothers and sisters in Christ trying to worship in their churches on Palm Sunday. And we say, well, that's what happens. In the Bible, it tells us, if you truly believe in Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted. And I stand up and go, how am I persecuted? I truly believe in Jesus Christ, don't I? How am I persecuted? Hebrews 13.3 Remember those who are in prison as if you were in prison with them. And those who suffer since you also, they also are a part of the body of Christ. How am I persecuted? When my brothers and sisters in those countries are not allowed to share faith without being humiliated, without being tortured, without being killed, I'm being persecuted as well. Because we are all one body, the temple of the living God. And we need to understand that. It's coming from one BGC person to all of you. There's one Baptist who understands our theology very well. Growing up in the Baptist church and yet not understanding that as the body of Christ, we have a responsibility to those people in Egypt to those people in Israel, in the West Bank, in Gaza, that the Palestinian Christians are also our brothers and sisters in Christ, that the Israeli Messianic Jews are our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, in Morocco, I'll share this and I'll I'll stop. In Morocco, um, I met with two pastors there. In Morocco, it's a country that's 100% Muslim. And these two pastors were standing, they have the joy of the Lord. They sing hymns, they sing worship songs, they play guitar, they raise their hands and shout hallelujah. We were on top of one of their roofs, and one of them said that he believes that Morocco In Morocco, Islam will fail and Christianity will become the main religion. 100% Muslim and he believes that Christianity will prevail. And my thought was in America, we have 60 to 70% that claim to be Christians and we're afraid Islam is taking over. Where's our faith? percent Muslim and he believes that his sharing the gospel is going to lead to a revival in a country that's 100% Muslim. I'm going to show you the pictures and some of the stories we didn't get to today, but the pictures of persecuted Christians. I would ask you to write down their names if you didn't already and pray for them. Um, It's just a short video so that you have some faces to put with the stories. Hey, Pastor Chris here. Just wanted to follow up as the rest of that message ends fairly abruptly. We cannot post the video that Brother Dave was speaking about 
because it contains photos and information about some people who live uh, in places where it is definitely not safe to be Christians. And therefore, we do not want to put their lives, their health, their well-being, or their church in jeopardy, so we will not include that video at the request of Brother Dave. But do be in prayer. Uh, many men and women across this globe uh, face persecution, do not have life as easy, cannot worship with the freedom that we have been afforded here in America. Give praise to God that we are free to worship. Uh, thank a veteran. Be thankful for those who've put their lives on the line for us. And then celebrate and rejoice and take full advantage of your ability to worship, to worship Jesus Christ openly and freely wherever you want. So take advantage of it. Do not take that for granted. Celebrate. Rejoice. Praise God. He is good. And in the end, also, keep praying for the persecuted church. Pray for God's protection, for God's provision. And as much as anything, pray for their boldness, that uh, they would thrive and multiply. That is indeed the greatest scenario. So thank you. Have a God-blessed day.